Well, let us open the Word of God together at John's Gospel, chapter 13. We read together from the end of the chapter uh, this morning. I want to read from the beginning uh, this evening as our foundational text for our message. John chapter 13 and reading from the first verse. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, the devil, having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he was come from God and went to God, he riseth from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After that he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus saith to him, He that is washed needeth not to save wash his feet, needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and ye are clean, but not all. For he knew who should betray him. Therefore said he, Ye are not all clean. So after he had washed their feet, and had taken his garments, and was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say, Well, for so I am. So I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an, exa an example, that ye should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. And so reads God's precious word to us. <clears throat> this morning we began <clears throat> this uh, series on the subject of loving one another by looking at chapter 13 of John or the end of the chapter and then some verses in Romans 12. This evening we will continue with other various exhortations which include this term. In our reading in John chapter 13, Christ presents himself as the great example of how we should love and how we should care for each other. That 14th verse, if I then your Lord and Master have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. Again, we see here the example principle that we considered in the end verses of the chapter in uh, verse 34. A new commandment I give unto you that ye love one another as I have loved you that ye also love one another. David Brown in his commentary puts it this way. If I then the Lord have washed your feet, the servants, ye, but fellow servants, ought to wash one another's feet. Not in the narrow sense of a literal washing, profanely caricatured by popes and emperors, but by the very humblest real services, one to another. Whatever our needs are, it was a great need, in that day to wash the feet. It was a practical need. 
It was a basic need. It was so basic and so practical that the humblest servant in the house uh, could do it. You, you might go to, um, uh, some of you ladies might go to a hairdresser's. And generally the people who wash the hair are the, the trainees. You can't make too many mistakes washing the hair, we hope. But that's done for the trainees, the most basic. And this job of washing the feet was done by the humblest servant, not the trained servant, not the servant that had been a long time in the house, but the new servant, the young servant, the one that might not be trusted with much other work, but they could do this. And here our Lord and Master washes the feet of his disciples. And he does this as an example, a twofold example of what his ministry was and what he wants us to do as disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, as his disciples. We are to be like him. Notice at the beginning of the chapter what it says now before the feast of the Passover when Jesus knew that his hour was come that he should depart out of this world unto the Father having loved his own which were in the world he loved them unto the end so this washing of the feet was done in the direct context of what he was going to do in his cross work. And then in verse 3, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he was come from God, and he went to God. See the contrast there. The contrast between the third verse and what follows. He consciously at this point knew that all things, Matthew 28, all power and all authority in heaven and in earth had been given to him. And that he was from God and he was going to God. Yet in this knowledge, he dresses himself in the garments of of the humblest servant and proceeds to wash his disciples' feet. We can understand Peter's objection. We can understand Peter's abhorrence at this because culturally this was not the right way. This was all wrong. And Peter <coughs> thinks he is being noble or being correct in forbidding the Lord to wash his feet. So it's not that Peter was in any way trying to um, say something bad or be wrong. In fact, Peter's desire was to be correct. Now I think there's an application for us in this. In our serving of one another, and in our loving of one another. We need to be prepared on the two sides. We need to be prepared to do the serving. But we also need to be prepared to be served. We need to have both attitudes. Sometimes we can be like Peter in the wrong sense. We cannot accept service or love from one another because we are proud uh, because um, we don't want uh, another believer to love us or to serve us in that way but we need as the Lord Jesus says in verse 8 if I wash thee not thou hast no part with me and as we consider this morning there is this Union between Christ and his people. That when Christ washes our feet. And when the, the humblest disciple washes our feet. It's as if he has done it. 
One of the most amazing things in this passage is, is that Christ does this even when Judas is present. For he knew who should betray him. Ye are clean, but not all. For he knew who should betray him. Sometimes in our service, we might think, well, this person is not worthy. I am not going to serve them. I'm not going to love them. The Lord Jesus, in the three and a half years of his ministry, included Judas in all the blessings and in all the love and in all the guidance and in every gift that he was going to give, Judas was included. There's a lesson here. That we are never to get to the point where we say, that person is not worthy of my love. We don't know, ultimately, who is saved and who is not saved. But we do not have the right to withhold in the church, especially in the church. Peter says, do good to all men and especially to the household of faith. We are commanded to wash the feet of the disciples. To take on that servant's garb, so to speak, and to help and to serve one another. Yes, we don't need our feet washed now. Some have turned that into a sacrament or an ordinance. Of course, that is wrong. But there are many other things that we need. And we are to be at the disposal of the Lord's people so that we might help them and be a help to them. Getting into now to some of the texts that we want to cover. We're going to back to Romans chapter 13. We, we looked at three examples in Romans chapter 12. Uh, this morning now we'll continue in Romans in chapter 13. Our fourth point, and that's continuing on from this morning's three points. Our fourth point is to love one another is a debt that we owe to each other. To love one another is a debt that we owe to each other. Romans 13 verse 7 reads, Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honour to whom honour. Then verse 8, Owe no man anything but to love one another. We are not just indebted to God in our salvation. We are not just indebted to Christ in our salvation. Christ has so ordered our salvation that we are indebted in salvation to one another. We owe this because we are the family of God. And in fact, in verse 8, at the beginning of verse 8, we are to put ourselves in a position where we're not indebted to anyone so that we're not hindered in the greatest debt that we have. The scripture says that the, the borrower is servant to the lender. So we are not to become any man's servant because that will interfere with our greatest responsibility. And that is to serve the people of God. So if I'm spending too much time and work, for whatever reason, is this interfering with my service to the people of God? If I'm doing other things out of a sense of duty, to the world or outside the church? Is this interfering with the commitment that Christ has put me under because I'm part of the household of faith? Do I create things 
in my life or in my mind that interfere with this great debt that I owe to God's people. Isn't it interesting? Isn't it surprising? And maybe you've never thought of it this way. That salvation does not mean I'm just in debt to God. But I'm actually in debt to the family of God as well. And then the the, the end of verse 8 reminds us again of our catechism question. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Now notice, this is not a work of super erogation. (laughs) This is our debt to one another. Look at Luke 17 just very briefly. Keep your fingers in Romans. And just Luke chapter 17. And just for the sake of time, well actually we, I need to make reference to the first few verses. In verse 1, uh, the Lord Jesus says, It is impossible but that offences will come, but woe unto him through whom they come. It were better for him that a milestone or a millstone were hanged about his neck and he was cast into the sea, than that he should offend one of these little ones. Take heed to yourselves, if thy brother trespass against thee, Rebuke him, and if he repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. Uh, I think there's very few believers who actually would practice that. In fact, quite often in practice we say, well, I've given you one or two chances. You fail a third time, you're out. That's not the way God deals with us. We come to God daily. Well, we should come to God daily with repentance. And he forgives us completely and wholly forgives us. But often the way it works with us is we build up a store of resentment. Well, that's the second time he's done wrong there towards me. That's the third time. And it builds, doesn't it? Mm. It builds. It doesn't build with God. God completely and wholly cleanses us and forgives us and we are to do the same with one another it's interesting the apostles response in verse 5 the apostles said unto the Lord increase our faith if only we had more faith but the Lord Jesus goes on to say it's not the amount of faith you need it's just the littlest you just need to obey (laughs) that's what he's saying they're using this as an excuse They're saying, oh Lord, we need great faith for that. The Lord says, no, you don't. You just need to obey. You just need to do what you're told. And the only amount of faith you need to do that is as small as a mustard seed. Verse 7. But which you, having a servant plowing or feeding cattle, will say unto him by and by when he has come from the field, go and sit down to meat. And will not rather say unto him, Make ready wherewith I may sup and gird thyself and serve me, till I have eaten and drunken, and afterward thou shalt eat and drink? Doth he thank that servant, because he did the things that were commanded him? I trow, or I think not. So likewise, when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded you, say, We are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. In this whole principle of loving one another, we are simply doing what we are commanded. And even when we do it all, we are to regard ourselves, according to Christ, as unprofitable servants. Now what's wonderful about that is, in contrast is that's not how he will treat us. He will treat us as good and faithful servants if we see ourselves in this light. What is God's will? Well, we've stated it. This is God's will, that we love one another. Sometimes we can go off on tangents You know, what is the will of God in this area and that area? Here's God's will. 
This is God's purpose. This is God's command. This is basic. We're not talking deep theology today, are we? This morning was basic. This evening is basic. This is foundational. But if we get this wrong, if we get this principle and these principles wrong, there's no point in going anywhere else. We must obey here. For this is the point A. This is square one. The next point back in Romans is in the negative. In Romans 14 and verse 10. We are not to judge one another. Something we're not to do. In Romans 14 and verse 10 we read, But why dost thou judge thy brother? And that's interesting what it goes on to say. Or why dost thou set, it clarifies it, Why dost thou set at naught, make nothing of thy brother? One of the problems with our type of judgment is that it's often designed to, so to speak, take the carpet from under the feet. It's meant to destroy. And that's the type of judgment that is here referred to. To make one another look bad. To show somebody up. That should never be our intention. So we might talk to one another about somebody else. Now if we say that which is patently true, that is one thing. But if our design is to make somebody just look uh, as if they are nothing, then this is wrong. It says in verse 10, For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Verse 13, Let us not therefore judge or make nothing of one another any more. But then he says, But judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block are on occasion to fall in his brother's way. We are to be so concerned for one another. We are, our main concern, going back to Luke 17, it's impossible that offences will come, but woe unto him through whom they come. <laughs> we should spend our lives as believers praying that we will not be the cause of offence to another child of God. That we will not be responsible for the stumbling of a child of God. James 4, you need to turn to this. James 4 verse 11 says, Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother, and judgeth his brother, speaketh evil of the law, and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and destroy, and art thou that judgest, and who art thou that judgest another? Now this raises a very important question, does it? Does this mean we're forbidden from making any form of judgment? Is, you know, can we never say anything? Can we never address anything at all? Well, the simple answer to that obviously is no. In fact, the two previous previous texts do not say that at all. In fact, both of them um, say, especially verse 13 of Romans 4, that we are to judge in a certain degree. Even if it is just that we not be the stumbling block. And in James 4.11, what is condemned is us setting ourselves up against or above the law of God. In other words, making ourselves a law maker. Or as if we are superior to the law of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and we'll turn there for a moment, we'll see this. And verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 9. 
Paul says to the church of Corinth, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous or extortioners, or with idolaters. For then must ye needs go out of the world. But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one know not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within. But them that are without God judgeth. Therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Notice what he's saying here. We are to make judgment. But we're to make a righteous judgment based upon the law of God. We're not to make our own personal judgments. You know, based upon what we want. Quite often, maybe it's the case that people are dealt with in a wrong way or in a, a negative way, not because they're a, they've broken the law of God. You see, maybe this man in this church that was committing this terrible sin, uh, maybe he was a buddy of some of the people in the church. Maybe he was a popular guy. And, and nobody really wanted to condemn him. Because he was so nice. We don't know. We don't know all the personal reasons. But quite often maybe in a church where somebody might actually be observing God's word. And trying to live according to uh, the principles of the faith. And we'll, and we'll sideline this person. We'll treat this person negatively based upon our own desires and wants. Rather than on the law of God. True in the chapter 6, dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unjust and not before the saints. Do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more the things that pertain to this life? If then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. I speak to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren. So, it's not that we are never to judge, but we are to make judgments based upon the word of God and not based upon what I think or how I feel at the time. Illustration of this, if I say it's a sin to steal, that's not me making a judgment, that's me simply echoing what the word of God says. That is not my judgment, that is God's judgment. That's not me becoming a judge. I'm just applying the principles of God's law. It's exactly what human judges do. In fact, a human judge is never meant to uh, step outside the remit of the law. He is there purely to bring to pass the full rigors of what the law already says. Contrary-wise, if I say it's it's a sin to wear the color red... Then I am setting myself up as a lawmaker and a judge in the wrong sense. That's why we had a discussion even uh, this afternoon. The nation, this country is responsible to enforce the word of God. According to Romans 13. This nation and this government are servants of God to enforce God's law. And they will be judged and this nation will be judged for not doing so. Also, Paul clearly tells the Roman Christians to make a serious judgment in chapter 16. In Romans chapter 16 and verses 17 and 18, he says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. We are to avoid the voice of people. We are to identify them. We're to identify people who cause division in the church 
and offences contrary to the doctrine which we have, lear have learned and we are to make a judgment and there thereby separate ourselves from them. That's a major judgment that we make as God's people. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Beware of people who speak well, but don't live it out. Doesn't mean... <laughs> If we're, if we're taking that to an ultimate extreme, we'd all fail. But we're talking about the character of the life. What's the character? What's the norm in their life? They say a good speech, but don't obey Christ. They're the people we are to avoid. And again, we are to make this, this decision not based upon how we feel. But in what God's word says. The man back in 1 Corinthians 5 was a popular guy, obviously, because nobody was taking a stand against him. But he was to be avoided and he was to be judged because he could say, obviously, good things, but was living a life of hypocrisy. He was not obeying Christ. And therefore, for his sake, and we see that in, in, in 1 Corinthians and in 2 Corinthians, this was to be done for his restoration. If we don't do this, this takes faith, doesn't it? Yes, as small as a mustard seed. It takes the smallest amount of faith because we do this in faith. We don't do it because we think it's the best thing. But because God has told us that it is the way we are to do things. I mean, some of these things we're, we're looking at, we probably should spend a lot more time on each point. I'm, I'm conscious of that. Um, we're, we're doing an overview on some of these things. I mean, there's a message there in itself, isn't there? There's a, at least one full sermon just on that point. I'm very conscious of that even at this moment. Our sixth main point is, and this is to give balance, or not, not balance, I don't mean that in the wrong sense, but to give another aspect. We are to receive one another. We are to receive one another. Romans 15 verses 5 to 7. Romans 15 verses 5 to 7. In, in verse 5 we have the root of how we receive one another. Now the God of patience and consolation. Grant you to be like minded. One toward another. According to Christ Jesus. We are to be like minded. And, and this is, the, this is the, the, the basis. Of receiving one another. If somebody is completely different. In regards to the faith. It's not saying like minded. In other words. Uh, you know, I am this type of person and he's that type of person. That's not what it means. Like, let me give an, an illustration here. Um, some people might say, well, we're going to get into some sort of business together. And, uh, you know, we're, you know, uh, we're the same type of person. We're, we're a mild temperament and so on. And therefore, we'll get on well in business. But if you have a completely different goal in the business, it doesn't matter what your temperament's like. Like-minded doesn't mean you're the same type of person. Like-minded means you have the same goals. You're actually going in the same way together in the kingdom of God. And this is foundational. Absolutely foundational. Receiving one another doesn't mean that, oh, well, it doesn't matter what you think or where you're going, you know, everybody's welcome. This is something we have to face as a church. We are to receive one another, but in the context of having the same goals in the kingdom of God. If somebody wants to join our church and they're a, a, a rampant charismatic who wants to bring in the gifts and so on, we have to say, well, whoa, whoa, whoa. it's not that we don't want to receive you, but we can't receive <laughs> the doctrines that you are bringing. So the foundation is like-mindedness, one mind. 
the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, and so on. Then we see the twofold fruit in verses 6 and 7. First of all, in our relationship with God, verse 6, that ye may with one mind and one, look at this, one mouth glorify God. This is what we must strive after as a church. That in the presence of God, we have one mind and one mouth. We're not saying different things. We're not doing different things. Now, this will take effort. This will take our life to do this. We're not going to achieve this tomorrow. That's not meant to be an excuse for failure. But this is something we all have to be committed to, that we can come to the point where we have one mindset and one mouth. In other words, saying the same thing. And this is the power, isn't it? In a church. If somebody comes in amongst us, we don't want them to hear different things. Like a, a practical example would be on, on Grafton Street on, on a Thursday evening. If, if I said the gospel was this and somebody else said the gospel was that, the person would say, well, you don't even know what you believe yourselves. But the fruit of this biblical receiving one another is in the context of a unity of mind and a unity of speech. With one mouth we glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul said to the Corinthians that he feared for them that if someone brought another Jesus, they would all too easily receive him. There's lots of different Christs in this world. And the Christ of antinomianism is not the Christ of the Bible. The Christ of easy believism is not the Christ of the Bible. We have to, with one mind and one mouth, glorify the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's the God that is revealed in the Scripture. So we're not commanded to receive anybody who just claims to be a Christian. In fact, in another place, Paul, I think it's to Timothy, is it? Where he says that we are to receive those who walk orderly. According to the tradition which you have received. So it's not a responsibility that anybody just says they're, they name the name of Christ. That we must treat them, you know, give them uh, suddenly um, all this um, attention. No, no, that's not what it's saying. It's those who walk according to the word of God. And we know as a church that we, so many areas where we need to apply ourselves to in this uh, need for church discipline, need for obedience, the need when things don't go the way uh, that they should. And, and that needs patience. And that needs love. We don't want to get to a, a place, do we, where we're just in a negative sense, afraid of one another. But then neither do we want to get to the place where we ignore one another. <laughs> Again, as we said this morning, who is sufficient for these things? Who is able to, to get this right? We do this, and brothers and sisters, we have to do this in the fear of God. But then... The second of the fruit is in the relationship to each other. Verse 7. Wherefore, receive ye one another as Christ also received us. Look what it says in verse 7. Does it say in verse 7, as Christ also received us in this world? That would be wonderful enough, wouldn't it? Look what verse 7 says. As Christ has received us. Even to glory. To the glory of God. And I think there's two aspects there. It's to the glory of God positionally. And it's to the glory of God. Um, it's, it's positionally in that sense. He's received us to the glory of God. To honor God. But he's also received us. He's brought us to the very glory of God. 
And sometimes we can talk about receiving each other, but only so far. Only so far. We are to receive one another for the glory of God, yes, but to the glory of God as well. We have two more points. I think we should stop there this evening and we'll continue again. So much that we have to say. So much, as I said this morning, that I am burdened with to say. And God willing that we will apply, all of us will apply these principles. The one thing that is on, is on my heart, well, one of the many things that's on my heart, is that as a pastor, and I, I think of what one preacher said, it's not just about being correct. It's about doing all these things that we might bring under God, bring each other that day when we will stand before Christ and we will have led one another to that place and we will have taken each other by the hand and brought each other to glory. That's what God has called us to do. May God help us to do so. Let us stand for prayer. Oh Lord, we we ask for your mercy. We ask for your help, Lord. For we are weak and we falter and we fail. But Lord, we ask that you would be our portion, that you would be our deliverer, our refuge, our strength, our rock, our fortress, our high tower, our place where we can dwell in the midst of the storm. We can dwell in thee. Oh Lord, help us and bless this church. Bless thy people and enable us, Lord, to obey the word of God, and to live lives worthy of the calling, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Help us, we pray. Forgive us our multitude of sins and grant us just enough faith so that we are not filled with ourselves, but we obey and we live for the glory of God, to the glory of God. O oh Lord, bless and pity us, even this night. We give thee thanks for those things that we shall receive and the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father, and the fellowship and communion of the blessed Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen.